Everlasting Chapter 5. When he woke up early next morning, the sun was only just opening its, its own eyes on the eastern horizon, and the cottage was full of silence. But she realized that sometime during the night, she had made up her mind. She would not run away today. Where would I go anyway, she asked herself. There is nowhere I really want to be. But in another part of her head, the dark part where her oldest fears were housed, she knew there was another sort of reason for staying at home. She was afraid to go alone. It was one thing to talk about being by herself, doing important things, but quite another when she, the opportunity arose. The characters in the story she read always seemed to go off without a thought or care. But in real life, well, the world was a dangerous place. People were always telling her so. And she would not be able to manage without protection. They were always telling her that too. No one ever said precisely what it was that um, she would not be able to manage, but she did not need to ask. Her own imagination supplied the horrors. Still, it was galling. This having to admit that she was afraid and when she remembered the toad, she felt even more disheartened. What if the toad would be out by the fence again today? What if he should laugh at her secretly and think she was a coward? Well, anyway, she could at least slip out right now, she decided, and go into the wood to see if she could discover what was really made that music the night before. That would be something anyway. She did not allow herself to consider the idea that making a difference in the world might require a bolder venture. She merely told herself, consolingly, of course, while I'm in the wood, if I, if I decide never to come back, well then, that will be that. She was able to believe in this because she needed to, and believing was her own true promising friend once more. It was another heavy morning, already hot and breathless, but in the wood, the air was cooler and smelled agreeably damp. Winnie had been no more than two slow minutes walking timidly under the interlacing branches when she wondered why she had never come here before. Why, it's nice, she thought with a great surprise, for the wood was full of light, entirely different from the light she was used to. It was green and amber and alive, quivering in splotches on the padded ground, fanning into sturdy stripes between the tree trunks. There were little flowers she did not recognize, white and palest blue, and endless tangled vines, and here and there a fallen log, half rotted but soft with patches of green velvet moss. And there were creatures everywhere, the air fairly humid with their daybreak activity, Beetles and birds and squirrels and ants and countless other things unseen, all gentle and self-absorbed and not in the least alarming. There was even, she saw with satisfaction, the toad. He was squatting on a low stump and she might not have noticed it, for it looked more like a mushroom than a living creature sitting there. As she came abreast of it, however, it blinked and the movement gave it away. See, she exclaimed, I told you I would be here first thing in the morning. The toad blinked again and nodded, or perhaps it was only swallowing a fly, but then it nudged itself off the edge of the stump and vanished in the underbrush. It must have been waiting for me, said Winnie to herself. It was very glad she had come. She wandered for a long time, looking at everything, listening to everything, proud to forget the tight pruned world outside, humming a little now, trying to remember the pattern of the melody she had heard the night before. And then, up ahead, in a place where the light seemed brighter than the ground, somewhat more open, something moved. Winnie stopped abruptly and crouched down. If it's really elves, she thought, I can have a look at them. And though her instinct was to turn and run, she was pleased to discover that her curiosity was stronger she began to creep forward. She would go just close enough, she told herself, just close enough to see. And then she would turn and run. But when she came near up behind a sheltering tree trunk and peered around it, her mouth dropped open and all thought of running melted away. 
There was a clearing directly in front of her at the center of which an enormous tree thrust it up. Its thick roots rumpling the ground 10 feet around in every direction. Sitting relaxed with his back against the trunk was a boy, almost a man, and he seemed so glorious to Winnie that she lost her heart at once. He was thin and sunburned, this wonderful boy with a thick mop of curly brown hair, and he wore his battered trousers and loose, grubby shirt as a much self-assurance as if they were silk and satin. A pair of green suspenders, more decorative than useful, gave the finishing touch, for he was shoeless, and there was a twig tucked between the toes of one foot. He waved the twig idly as he sat there, his face turned up to gaze at the branches far above him. The golden morning light seemed to glow all around him, while brighter patches fell, now on his lean brown hands, now on his hair and face, as the leaves stirred over his head. Then he rubbed an ear carelessly, yawned, and stretched. Shifting his position, he turned his attention to a little pile of pebbles next to him. As when he watched, scarcely breathing, he moved the pile carefully to one side, pebble by pebble. Beneath the pile, the ground was shiny wet. The boy lifted a final stone, and when he saw a low spurt of water, arching up and returning like a fountain into the ground. He bent and put his lips to the squirt, drinking noisily sleep. And then he sat up again and drew his shirt sleeves across his mouth. As he did this, he turned his face in her direction and their eyes met. For a long moment, they looked at each other in silence, the boy with his arm still raised to his mouth. Neither of them moved. At last, his arm fell to his side. You may as well come out, he said with a frown. Winnie stood up, embarrassed, and because of that, resentful. I didn't mean to watch you, she protested as she stepped into the clearing. I didn't know anyone would be here. The boy eyed her as she came forward. What are you doing here? He asked her sternly. It's my wood, said Winnie, surprised by the question. I can come here whenever I want to. At least, I was never here before, but I could have come any time. Oh, said the boy, relaxing a little. You're one of the Fosters, then. I'm Winnie, she said. Who are you? I'm Jesse Tuck, he answered. How do... And he put, his hand, put out a hand. Winnie took his hand, staring at him. He was even more beautiful up close. Do you live nearby? She managed at last letting go of his hand reluctantly. I never saw you before. Do you come here a lot? No one's supposed to. It's our wood. Then she added quickly. It's all right, though, if you come here. I mean, it's all right with me. The boy grinned. No, I don't live nearby. And no, I don't come here often. Just passing through. And thanks. I'm glad it's all right with you. That's good, said Winnie, irrelevantly. She stepped back and sat down, primarily a short distance from him. How old are you anyway? She asked, squinting at him. There was a pause. At last he said, why do you want to know? I just wondered, said Winnie. All right, I'm 104 years old, he told her solemnly. No, I mean, really, she persisted. Well then, he said, if you must know, I'm 17. Seventeen? That's right. Oh, said Winnie, hopelessly. Seventeen. That's old. You have no idea, he agreed with a nod. Winnie had the feeling he was laughing at her, but decided it was kind of a nice kind of laughing. Are you married? She asked next. This time he laughed out loud. No, I'm not married, are you? Now it was Winnie's turn to laugh. Of course not, she said. I'm only 10, but I'll be 11 pretty soon. And then you'll get married, he suggested. Winnie laughed again, her head on one side, admiring him. And then she pointed to the spurt of water. Is that good to drink, she said. I'm thirsty. Jesse Tug's face was instantly serious. Oh, that? No, no, it's not, 
he said quickly. You mustn't drink from it. Comes right from the ground, probably pretty dirty. And he began to pile the pebbles over it. But you drank some, when he reminded him. Oh, did you see that? He looked at her anxiously. Well, me, I'll drink anything. I mean, I'm used to it. I wouldn't be good for you, though. Why not? said Winnie. She stood up. It's mine anyway. If it's in my wood, I want some. I'm about dry as dust. She went to where he sat and knelt down beside the pile of pebbles. Believe me, Winnie Foster, said Jessie. It would be terrible for you to drink any of this water. It's just terrible. I can't let you. Well, I don't see why not, said Winnie plaintively. I'm getting thirstier every minute. If it didn't hurt you, it won't hurt me. If my papa was here, he'd let me have some. You're not going to tell him about it, are you? Said Jesse. His face had gone very pale under its sunburn. He stood up and put a bare foot firmly on the pile of pebbles. I knew this would happen sooner or later. Now what am I going to do? As he said this, there was a crashing sound among the trees and a voice called, Jesse! Thank goodness, said Jesse, blowing out his cheeks in relief. Here comes my Miles. They'll know what to do. And sure enough, a big, comfortable-looking woman appeared, leading a fat old horse. And at her side was a young man, almost as beautiful as Jesse. It was May Tuck with her other son, Jesse's older brother. And at once, when she saw the two of them, Jesse with his foot on the pile of pebbles, and Winnie on her knees beside him. She seemed to understand. Her hand flew to her bosom, grabbing at the old brochet that fastened her shawl, and her face went bleak. Well, boys, she said, here it is. The worst is happening at last. <laughs>